I decided to reenact for this lecture on a small scale two major surveys of the impact of the popular image of the scientist as transmi transmitted through the culture and especially through film on groups of school children. And the first of these surveys was by the anthropologist Margaret Mead some 45 years ago, and she looked at 35,000 American high school children. And the other, by a man called David Chambers, five years later, looked at 5,000 school children in the 5 to 11 age range in Montreal, Canada. And Chambers asked the whole of his sample group the same question without preparing for it in advance. Draw a scientist. Mead used a questionnaire, but both surveys came to strikingly similar conclusions. Especially among the 9 to 11 year olds, scientists were thought to have Einstein hair, Coke bottle spectacles, a white lab coat, bubbling glassware, and behind them a door marked secret. Um, this was the 1950s. They were also thought to be almost exclusively male. Of Chambers group, over 2,000 girls took part, but only 28 of them drew a female scientist. So I reenacted the draw a scientist test in the primary school in the West Country for a recent book I did on the scientists in the cinema. And the results, I thought it must have changed since the 50s and 60s, but actually they were depressingly similar, except there were more female scientists this time. They tended to be younger. The males tended to have goatee beards and brand names on their t-shirts. And there were slightly less lab coats. I'll give you some of the examples. This one, uh, a girl at 11 drew this. And what's absolutely wonderful is in case you haven't got the message, it says, mad, on his lapel pocket. Um, that was one. Just give you an idea, there are hundreds of these drawings. Actually, they're being displayed at the Wellcome Institute at the moment in, in their thing on the public understanding of something. Mad. Simply going into a primary school and saying, draw a scientist, and then pick it, and you have to write your name, your age, your gender, and the form you're in on the back or on the front. Actually, they were asked to do it on the back, and most of them do it on the front. And, uh, and then collect them up five minutes later. It's a gut thing about the image, uh, the image of the scientist. I am a mad scientist. Can't even spell scientist, unfortunately. But, uh, only nine, only nine, with a hypodermic. So I'm squirting something. <laughs> You get the point. Now, it's interesting because these surveys, uh, a, a parallel survey was done a couple of years ago asking a series of primary school children in Essex to uh, do a self-portrait. And what was interesting about these self-portraits is that like a lot of children's drawings, they all look the same. What differentiates them is the brand names on their t-shirts, <laughs> which is seriously scary. Now, we're talking age 8 to 9, age 7 to 8, Gap, Gap, uh, Nike, so the identity comes through the brand name on your t-shirt, not your physical characteristics. So these things do tell you things that are quite interesting. Anyway, I did it for the engineers. I revisited the primary school for a draw the engineer test, the first ever conducted, so far as I know. And the rules were simple. The children ages 4 to 11 were asked to write again their name, age, gender, and form on the back of a piece of paper. And then without hesitation, that was the point, Without hesitation, they were to turn over the paper in five minutes flat, draw an engineer. The results amply confirmed the conclusion of C.P. Snow and his critic of 50 years ago. Maybe this isn't surprising. To ask primary school children to draw a scientist is one thing, because there really is an, an accepted set of signs, visual signs associated with scientists. To ask them to draw an engineer is probably a much more complicated thing to ask at that age. Plus, of course, to draw, ask someone to draw a person of any profession is to ask for the stereotype, but of course that's the point. I could reveal that the predominant props from five to six-year-olds in year one to 10 to 11-year-olds in year six include spanners, drills, toolboxes, tool bags, overalls, patched overalls, cars, vans, engines, saws, hammers, petrol pumps, and a hopeful sign, a maths book. <laughs> Only in a handful of cases are there keyboards, and in one case, a much-used Xerox machine. Where the look of the engineer in person is concerned, there are bobble hats, diamond-pattern jumpers, t-shirts, one with 
focus, but it is written on it. <laughs> Computers for brains, big hair, beard, spectacles, eye protectors, <coughs> face masks. But most of the engineers look like teenagers, which may be hopeful. Here are a few examples to tell you what I mean. Okay. I think it's rather a wonderful one, actually. Um, draw an engineer. <laughs> Yeah. It's interesting. Presumably, it's the children's experience of someone who's been called an engineer, television engineer, the AA man, whatever. So the word's been heard. Just AA ask. Just ask. Okay, then we'll have everything. Evening. Thank you for a brilliant lecture. Uh, Ray Pittman, my question is if the bridging of different disciplines is not always succeeding, what opportunities do you see? for breaking down the differences between the disciplines, and do you see that as an opportunity? Yeah, well I think, it, it's interesting, I mentioned the matrix, and uh, actually this is Anna Cummings, isn't it, again the idea in Minority Report of this very positive image of the engineer, sort of Tom Cruise using all these graceful body movements to touch screens and everything. There are some uh, very positive images of people finding their way around the world of electronics and so on. Um, but no one seems to associate them with engineering, and I think one of the challenges is to, to, to uh, to use those very positive images, which are very positive role models, and in some way relate them to what engineers do, because that bridge has not been made, I don't think. People don't think of Keanu Reeves and Tom Cruise as engineers, but in fact they are in those films, in a sense. Um, but um, whether it's possible, you know, I could do an equivalent lecture on the image of the designer, which would be equally uh, out of date, uh, or the image of the artist, which uh, um, actually I'm working on one at the moment, where it's all, um, uh, lunatics, I mean, basically, uh, no, I mean, uh, very, very um, uh, stressed out, uh, highly expressive, very angry, marginal people as artists. Uh, the Van Gogh image, you know, Van Gogh and the Crowfield, that's basically it. And uh, cinema's terrible at cool, uh, analytical, Magritte type artists who put on a suit and go to work in the morning. It doesn't work. I mean, no one believes they're artists. They've got to be angry. And so all of these things have a sort of stereotype that chimes with the audience. It somehow works, and that's what they think. So whether you can ever fight it, whether it matters is another question. You know, I mean, I, um, uh, I sent the results of the survey to uh, the, the chief scientific officer of the government when I did the science one, and he was quite worried. In fact, they had a question in the house about it, about you know, how worrying it was that uh, young people had such a negative image of science. But then someone stood up and said, actually, it's quite a positive image. It's all about power. You know, these, these scientists who want to change the world and so on. You could argue it's actually quite attractive in a warped sort of way. And uh, so, does it matter? I don't know. It's certainly there. Uh, will it ever change? I don't know. I'm afraid I finished on the question there, but uh, it would take an awful lot, I think, to, to create. Um... Well, the other thing is that, you know, if, if um, as someone said, if, uh, if you showed a movie about a real scientific research project, the first half of the movie would be doing the grant application. <laughs> uh, which is like watching paint dry, isn't it, really? The second half is sort of assembling the team, the peer group, you know, the, the arrangements for the team, and working for about five years before you get any results. But, you know, watching... I mean, it's quite difficult to dramatise that activity in any... But the one people who attract it is doctors, I think. If you look at all those American TV series about hospitals, <coughs> You really do get a sense of what it's like to work in a casualty uh, department, particularly the American series. And even police, you know, all these police procedural. In the old days, it was the individual detective in a deer stalk, and now it's a, a precinct with 100 cases going on at the same time, an utter chaos. You know, it's much nearer what it's really like to be a policeman. And I think in, in doctors, too, in American TV. So it can be done. You can find a way of dramatizing what it's really like to work in those worlds. But then it's never really been found, I think, for scientists. Or maybe not yet. Or engineers. So, yeah.